Tonight, we look at the story that has been told about the murder of John Benet Ramsey and why so many think her parents guilty and what this tells us about the America she so briefly lived in. We now have pretty irrefutable DNA evidence according to the DA's office and that's the most significant thing to me and certainly we are grateful that they acknowledge that we, you know, based on that, certainly could not have been involved. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 45 in the ongoing series and this is easily the most challenging episode thus far of the past 45 episodes. If there's any area of the JonBenet Ramsey case that requires true crime rocket science, this is it. It's by no means the only area. I think another area that requires a different kind of thinking to what we've seen by the journalists, by the investigators, has to do with family dynamics and child psychology, but this is certainly another area. I would say, and obviously this is just my opinion, I would say that the intruder theory loses to the other hypothesis, Six Love, but I would say that the DNA story is a much closer contest, certainly on the face of it. It is a tiebreak compared to the, uh, the intruder theory. Of course, the DNA myth gives credence to the intruder theory and then suddenly you are back in the game, suddenly you're back in the match. And that's exactly what happened. You had the grand jury pronouncing on the Ramses, rejecting the intruder theory, and then in 2008, effectively almost a decade later, the whole case is turned upside down. And that happened by the successor to um, District Attorney Alex Hunter, Mary Lacey, and we haven't really spoken about her much, and we're not going to speak about her much here either. But she basically, her role in the whole saga was that she was someone who spent a lot of time, I think she was a sex assault investigator before becoming district attorney. So she was very aware of that aspect. And I think that is what she saw into the John Bonet Ramsey because she saw that. And so they were looking for um, the DNA of this, basically a pedophile predator. That is what she investigated, that is what she saw, and she wasted no time um, exonerating, quote-unquote, exonerating the Ramses, even apologizing to them. In this episode, we're going to test that narrative, and we're going to do that by starting off by looking at the Ramsey side, which is the defense case, for why the DNA story is compelling, and it is compelling to some extent, why it has legs, if you want to put it that way, um, what is going on there. And what's definitely, I think it is definitely something that can change the entire case. It can change your mind. And we're going to talk about that, whether that's justified, whether the DNA myth should um, basically change everything, that it's a game changer. Before we get to that, Thank you to the 100 or so people who've subscribed since the last episode. This channel is now at 30,000 subscribers. So thanks a lot to everyone who's here. If you haven't subscribed yet, click on the icon on the bottom right. Like, share, leave a comment. If you do share, please use the hashtag TCRS. That's including in Facebook posts, Twitter, etc. Right, and let's get started. I think the best way to start off this narrative is to emphasize that this is something that the Ramses themselves repeat quite often. Uh, if you go into John Andrews' Twitter feed, he seems to, I won't say fixate, but he seems very, very focused on the DNA as the solution to the case. And in fact, in the, the, this very recent 2020 documentary, it sort of plays out, it concludes with John Andrew talking about that there is a way to solve this case and we're going to do it through facts and science 
And that's something that this channel certainly respects, so both of those things. And while he's talking, you sort of see DNA strands sort of rotating slowly as if what he's saying is DNA is the key to solving this case. Is it true? Of course, that is also what Lou Smith was saying. And it was something that he was saying just before he died in 2010. And his idea was that you simply just test DNA through an endless line of suspects, right? Quite easily done. That's all you do. You just test um, people through the DNA and you'll eventually find your killer. I've just got a simple question about that. Has it worked? It's a very simple solution. Has it worked? So you might say the DNA myth isn't a myth, it's science. And so that's how you're going to find your killer. Just test for DNA. Well, there have been 25 years to do that. And arguably, you could say not 25 years, 10 years. You could say since Mary Lacey exonerated the Ramses, which was in about 2008, there's been at least a decade in which to test people. And that is one of the ironies of this evidence is that they, you know, you might say, well, an intruder did it or someone other than the Ramses did it. So, well, what is interesting is using the DNA that is available, they have been able to exclude Santa Claus, a.k.a. Bill McReynolds. They have been able to exclude a lot of other people, such as Fleet White, who were suspects. And obviously, they were also able to exclude John Mark Carr. So it kind of works both ways, is that this so-called DNA, which is supposed to implicate an intruder, has actually been able to exclude all of them so far. And what I, I don't really intend playing a semantic game in terms of this, where you say, oh, well, so I guess the DNA excludes the intruder. We want to be more explicit than that. We want to look at the DNA scientifically and see what's really going on here. And this is where I think the narrative starts to dry up. This is where the pundits, the commentators, the detectives, the police, everybody involved reach a kind of a dead end. And they don't know where to take this further. And this is, I guess, an area where true crime rocket science may um, uh, move the leading edge of this case just a little bit further than everybody else has. I'm going to play you a clip now from ABC's 2020 and you have a, a journalist who has been on this case for decades, essentially from the beginning, Elizabeth Vargas. And I believe that what she's saying, she really believes. I believe that she seems to be have a, her mind changed by the DNA evidence, right? Let's listen in. That's a pretty big thing. That's a pretty clear indication that somebody else was there. You've got DNA now in three places on John Bonet's body that doesn't match anybody in the Ramsey family, anybody, and nobody knows whose it is. This evidence was good enough for Mary Lacey to basically close the file on the Ramseys and basically say, look, this is enough is enough. And John Ramsey then responded by saying, thank you very much, basically. And that is where the narrative has gone since then. The thing that I think is definitely quite interesting is the way that this evidence basically trumps the grand jury. So it doesn't matter what the grand jury said. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, I don't think what the grand jury decided, and you can think about this on your own time, whether the indictments that the grand jury came up with, I don't think that that has any relevance to the the to DNA, right? I think what they decided, they decided based on other evidence and information that they got. What is definitely a counter argument to that is you could say, would the grand jury have discounted, dismissed, disagreed with Lou Smith's presentation? On the intruder theory, had there been more DNA evidence, right, more modern DNA evidence? And that's one of the modern arguments dismissing the grand jury saying, oh, they didn't have access to that information. This is new information, new technology. So this actually proves that they were wrong, right? And that's quite an interesting argument, but we're going to test that argument in this episode.
I think the the best way to do that is to hold up the the one side on its own, on its own merits, and then to look at the other side and see how far it goes. And then, of course, we go into, let's call it uh, the true crime rocket science uh, archive, where you sort of say, okay, is there any information besides the Boulder police narrative? besides the Ramsey narrative that tells us something that people have either forgotten about or that they don't know or that changes things somewhat, right? So that's the third dimension to that. So we're going to first look at the duality, which is, okay, so let's start with Team Ramsey. We can really start by looking at what the Ramseys themselves have said about it. I've already mentioned John Andrew, and you can just go to his Twitter page to see to what extent he fixates on it, sorry, let's not say fixates, but just focuses on it and recycles it, and that is good enough for him. Uh, We've heard John Ramsey, as soon as Mary Lacey said what she said, he was very quick to say thank you very much for that. But there's also Patsy's sister, Pam, who kind of at the time said, um, well, this is actually a quote from what she said. Um, You know, we were visiting in the home a lot, And she said, my DNA could even be on, she said, I don't know how long DNA lives, um, but she said, the co-mingling DNA that does exist has been separated. She said, one of the DNA strands, there's a quote from Pam Paul, Patsy's sister. She says, one of the DNA strands does belong to John Bonet. The other has only been tested, I'm told, against Patsy, John and Burke, of which there is unequivocally no match, right? So that is true. What she's saying there is true. So when w- w- the DNA that they found, and as far as I remember, this was in her, in her panties, in her underwear. Um, this belonged to to John Bonet, and then also belonged to someone else. And but not any of the Ramses. And how do we account for that? How do we account for it not belonging to Patsy, John or Burke? And what I find just quite interesting in this particular comment is the reference to the word co-mingling DNA. So you don't have a, a really um, explicit sample where, okay, there's a DNA sample that is, that is um, or um, there is a... Um, there are particles, and okay, so that is just John Bonnet's DNA. There's another particle, and that is um, this unknown person's DNA. It's commingled. What does that mean? What are we talking about? And so she goes on to say, I'm told that it was found on the inside of John Bonnet's panties. Now, once again, you can say, that is really strong evidence. Well, they've found DNA not belonging to John, Patsy, or Burke inside, on the inside of John Bonnet's Patsy's panties. That is really compelling evidence. And I agree with that on the face of it. She goes on to say, that to me does blow this whole thing wide open because we know that it doesn't match Patsy, John, or Burke, and we know that it doesn't include John Bernays, and it's commingled, meaning some kind of physical contact, not necessarily just caught it in the washing machine or something, right? Now, I think that's also quite an interesting comment by P- Pam, which is how could commingling happen? And one thing we know for a fact is that somebody wiped down John Bernay after everything happened. She was wiped down. And it is possible that whatever um, was used to wipe her down, whether it's toilet paper or a rag or whatever, that that could account to some extent for the commingling. But this doesn't address the idea which Elizabeth Vargas um, highlights quite well and and other people do as well. For example, Paula Woodward, and we're going to get to what she says, is that you actually have this foreign DNA in under John Bonnet's fingernails, that's one source, right? You have it under John Bonnet's panties, that's another source, and then you have it also on the long johns or the um, underwear, if, if you want to call it that, right? That's the third source. And the claim is being made that all three sources were the same, you know, the same from the same donor, right? 
So what is under John Bonnet's fingernails, what is on the inside of her panties and on the long johns are three for three. They're all from the same unknown donor and it's not one of the Ramseys. Is that compelling evidence? Absolutely. So w what can you do with that? What can you do with that except, say, Jeepers, an intruder had to have been involved? I mean, w what other explanation is there? There can't be an innocent explanation for this, can there? Pam Paul goes on to say, so whose is it? And she says, I'm betting my money on the fact that it matches her killer. And that is what we need professional investigators to go and say, well, who's got the motive and who should be tested against this DNA? Some other Ramsey supporters, such as Jameson, uh, Susan Bennett, had the idea that the source of this foreign DNA could have been the seat of John Bonnet's new bicycle. Just that, you know, she was riding on the seat and obviously she had clothing on, but possibly that was how the foreign DNA got in there. And um, I think that's quite a fanciful theory. I don't agree with it. I don't really understand why she needs to come up with such an exotic theory, but there you have it. It might just be to provide a counter to that narrative that it could have come about through the manufacturing process, right? But... If you have an explanation like that, you know, that it came about through the manufacturing process, the problem is that it also comes up in the, in the long johns. If we go back to Lou Smith, he made, a, he made certain remarks in a documentary that was Ramsey Apology, and what he said is something we've heard so often. He said, quote, this crime can be solved. Our killer in this case left a lot of evidence behind. John Bonnet under fingernails had her blood, no doubt about it. John Bonnet under her fingernails also had foreign DNA. In her panties there is foreign DNA. It does not belong to anybody in this family. I think John Bonnet got a piece of her killer. There is also a hair left at the scene. It was right on the blanket that was covering John Bonnet. End quote. And so, seen in isolation, these quotes are pretty com convincing, pretty compelling, wouldn't you say? The plot thickens even more when you get this impression that this DNA of this unknown person, it appears that the Boulder police withheld this, let's call it inconclusive information from the authorities. And I'm not sure if they withheld it from the Ramses because the Ramses required the discovery in order to you know, agree to questioning. So I'm not 100% sure whether they didn't know about this, but the point is that they were sort of withholding this DNA um, evidence. And you could make the argument, wow, so it was a witch hunt. They were pursuing the Ramses, even though, you know, and you might imagine Mary Lacey saying this. Well, you, you knew that the Ramses weren't guilty, but you just were so obsessed with them that you had to go after them, didn't you? There's also the DNA narrative to talk about in more detail. You know, they took um, samples for the first time. I think it was in early to mid-January. Then there was a second phase of taking the samples. And then a third phase in, I think it was after September 1998, after the grand jury convened. So basically there were three sets of these DNA tests and then there was the fourth essentially that I'm aware of there may even have been more 10 years later in 2008 with, when they were sent off to Bode Laboratories right you could also argue from the DNA testing that was done in 2008 that the Boulder PD botched the investigation in terms of the DNA testing you know there were there was evidence hiding there and they didn't find it and it was up to somebody else the DA's office who took the file from Boulder PD and took it further and then made this particular finding, this finding of DNA in the underwear. And at the time, so at the time that these initial tests were done by Cellmark, um, you know, they extracted DNA from the fingernails and panties and the two hairs and they sent it to Cellmark, which is the largest private DNA testing lab in the country and no DNA identification could be found from the underwear stains or, or the hair other than that John Bonnet could possibly be the source, right? 
and so it's it's Boulder PD's fault for not doing more thorough testing or not authorizing more thorough testing such as under the waistband under that tight sort of elastic band of the of the panties something else that I think is worth noting is that on the 19th of May 2004 the Ramses had a website that had that was basically to promote uh, John Ramsey's campaign. He was a Republican candidate for the state of Michigan. And um, I think there was an announcement on May, that, that was announced on May 11. And then on the campaign website, in a section dealing with the Ramsey case, I think it was titled Family Tragedy Update or something. They claimed, this was on this Ramsey website, that forensic ep- experts had successfully identified the final DNA marker from a sample found in John Monet's underwear and that the family had been advised that this sample came from her murderer, right? And so effectively they were exonerating themselves in 2004 as John Ramsey was sort of running for office. Now what's interesting about that is this claim was disputed by forensic scientists and it uh, uh, went all the way into the media it sort of led to a debate Lynn would then uh, weighed in on all of this and he told the media that and this is a quote from him he said anyone in law enforcement investigation who is searching for an innocent explanation for foreign male DNA found in the victim's blood on her underwear is either incompetent or prejudiced prejudiced to the point of being unqualified to participate in a fair and objective investigation, end quote. I think the final thing I want to emphasize about the DNA myth is that it featured basically at the conclusion of the Killing of John Bonet, the Final Suspects podcast, right? And in episode 29, which I think was the penultimate episode, I think there were 30, and it was the penultimate episode, the episode was called A Way Forward, and this is a description of that episode. Quote, At the time of John Bonet's death, DNA profiling was in its infancy. That meant that what today's forensic scientists would consider standard procedures were not carried out. John Andrew Ramsey, John Bonet's stepbrother, joins the team as they meet with a forensic scientist to understand how DNA evidence is the way forward in solving the case. So I'm not going to take it any further than that. If you'd like to listen to the rest of this episode, head on to patreon.com slash tcrs. There is a discount if you sign up for a year's membership. And there's a plenty of content uploaded on a daily basis. There are many series on different cases. And there are also over a dozen audio books, including Christmas Star. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time. A local Boulder journalist, Charlie Brennan, uncovered a DNA report that was unknown to even members of law enforcement 